the Clark County Commissioner, and from the offices of the Honorable Marco Rubio, Ms. Sarah Davila. We're standing inside the gates of Launch Pad 39B here at Kennedy Space Center, which in the late, late 1960s was open for business. Launch Pad 39A and 39B and Launch Pad 41 were the uh, launch pads that we most recently opened for business until today. Today we are here to open up Launch Pad 39C, which is a small class launch vehicle site, the latest step in Kennedy's transition to a multi-user spaceport for both government and commercial providers and their customers. And with us today are some of the key players who have, for the last four years, worked on this Kennedy Space Center transition. I'd like to introduce Kennedy Space Center Director Bob Cabana to begin the operation today. Thanks, Mike. Thank you all for coming out today. As, uh, as America's premier spaceport, we're always looking for new and innovative ways to meet America's launch needs. And one area that was missing was uh, small class payloads. And so, using 21st century funds, we built Pad 39C with uh, lots of methane fueling, universal fueling stations, and we're going to support the small class payloads, of which there are a number of companies that are interested in coming here to uh, KSC to make that happen. So I think this is absolutely uh, great to designate a new pad within the confines of 39B, Pad 39C, and I'm looking forward to having uh, customers here in the not too distant future taking use of this outstanding uh, facility. And with that, I want to bring Scott Colorado up. Scott's the director of my center planning and development office here at KSC. He's going to give the details on the pad and uh, what interest there is in, in these small class payloads. So Scott, come on up and share some details about this. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say that, uh, to put this in a little bit of perspective, uh, over the last four years, over the last four years, we've gone through a major transformation. Um, we started out in 2011, to stop and think about it, we really had not much of a manifest. Shuttle was ending, space launch system didn't yet exist, and the commercial environment was not yet uh, mature enough to really warrant doing a lot of what we're doing today. But if you stop and think about it, today we now have four launch sites under construction all of which will support human spaceflight. And like I say, we stop and think about that a lot because we've always had two launch pads basically dedicated to that purpose, and now we've doubled that. And so a lot of people don't believe me when I say that because they do the work here, they don't realize that that's even possible. But if you look behind me, of course, there's 39B, which in 2011 was sanctioned as the uh, space launch system pad. It's also a multi-use clean pad that's being designed for the, the heaviest rocket in the world. So we're proud of that, and it gets us into our foot in the door in the post-shuttle era for human spaceflight. Meanwhile, the commercial food program uh, awarded two contracts to SpaceX and Boeing, both of whom were allowed to basically propose to go anywhere they wanted, essentially, and they chose to come here. So right down the road here at Complex 41, the Atlas V and Boeing CST-100 site is being redesigned, modified to support that program. So we think that's a big deal. And right up the road, we just signed a 20-year agreement with SpaceX to operate out of Launchpad 39A. And uh, again, they're, they're both making modifications to support human spaceflight programs. So already today, three human spaceflight programs within just a couple of miles of us are being supported by three different launch sites. Meanwhile, last month, we just signed an agreement with Space Florida, a 30-year agreement. So over the next 30 years, they have the shuttle landing facility. And most people don't think of that as a launch site, but in reality, that's exactly what it can be. Uh, and Space Florida plans to do that. So we're looking forward to that poor human-rated launch site. We think that's a big deal. So even with all that, so that's four, Today, as Bob said, we're sanctioning a, a fifth launch site at Kennedy Space Center, which again, just blows my mind because just a few years ago, we, we barely needed the two we have. But Pad 39C is the latest addition uh, to our portfolio. And, and as Bob said again, the small class market is here. It's uh, essentially a, uh, a new market. It's like a cell phone or a lot of things that come along their first kind of 
you know, big and bulky and that sort of thing and heavy. They're now satellites in a lot of ways are getting smaller, leaner, electronics are getting smaller, and the demand for that kind of launcher is going up. And uh, we basically have right about 10 or 12 companies that have actually come to this site and toured it and uh, are interested in using it. So, and I realize it doesn't look like a whole lot. It's a concrete slab, and we have uh, brought out our valve skids here with the universal propellant servicing system on the left and right. These happen to be for locks and methane. But the key here is really this is what a commercial launch site for a small class launcher needs to look like. It's lean, it's mean, it's clean, and essentially the, the commercial company can do what they need to do, set up what their ground support equipment to launch their vehicle. So we, we feel real good about the fact that that's a, a, something that they can use and we really don't have to provide a whole lot of, of heavy duty infrastructure. And this was a, a really cheap way of doing that. And we think it's going to accommodate a healthy number of vehicles. We don't assume that there'll be 10 or 12 actually using it, but that interest being so high tells us that it's worth doing something like this. So, and as Bob also said, we all, you know, we've always been on the heavy launch complex or heavy uh, class vehicle class. Um, now we're migrating down to these smaller classes because, like I say, it is a, a new environment, and, and that's what the commercial market is demanding, and we want to support that. Um, to just tell you a little bit about the pad, like I say, it's very clean, it's versatile, as you can see in some of the graphics. Uh, the, the way we design this is you, if, if your vehicle wants to be stacked vertically off-site and rolled out and, and launched that way, this supports that. If it wants to come out horizontally and rotate it to vertical, like some of the rockets do, a lot of them do nowadays, we support that as well. Um, and any version, any hybrid uh, between those, this launch site would support it. And as I said, locks and methane are what's supported here today. Um, we can certainly add to that and cite different commodities out there. Those are two popular ones. RP1 is another one. A variety of commodities we can support right here and launch the vehicle. So this is very tailorable to different launch, uh, launch uh, systems. So uh, and just to maybe point out, so despite all that, we also have a few things going on to promote commercial space even further. Uh, right now, today, we actually have, for the first time ever, we have two commercial announcements announcing availability, one for two new launch sites. So in addition to all this, we have a launch site 48, we call it, which is south of 39A. It's basically a site. There's nothing there built. But we've zoned that area to be uh, available for commercial users. We also have launch site 49 north of 39B that could also be uh, sited on, for commercial money if they're if they're willing and, and wanting to do that, it's available to, to do that. Uh, and we also, I just want to say, we, we continue to streamline our processes, and we are morphing to this multi-user spaceport. We're going from one that was a federal, uh, maybe a more typical, conventional federal spaceport. Now we're going to multi-use. Our processes are being optimized, streamlined. We continue to look at that all the time to make sure that commercial companies, when those launch rates go higher, that we'll be able to support that. So we're really excited about not only what we've done, but what we continue to do. We want to make that as, as easy and commercial friendly as possible. So, um, what else? Oh, and I just want to say we are talking to more commercial companies. Um, it never stops uh, as the Director of Center Planning and Development and the self-appointed Chief Optimist for Kennedy Space Center. It doesn't give me any more money, I don't think. I haven't found that out, but it, it is a good time to be optimistic because, I, as I said, you know, we, we think we're doing some great things here and, and we've accomplished a lot, but we're not done. We still have a lot we want to do. Um, so, and I think uh, my job is to recognize a few of the people that work on this. Like I say, this is, it doesn't look like much, but trust me, this is a difficult project to try to design this, this system right here amongst the launch pad right next to you, but it, it took a lot of talent to do it. We just want to recognize at least uh, three project managers from NASA, uh, Bill Simmons uh, from the 21st Century. He's our 21st Century uh, uh, Launch Complex Senior Project Manager. Nick Murdoch, the Construction and Facilities Project Manager. And uh, Robert Johnson, who's actually the head of this uh, Universal Propellant Servicing System. You can clap for him. I'm not sure he made it, but I still appreciate that when he sees it on TV. Uh, also, we have uh, Jones Evans and Associates, who actually designed the pad itself. I believe they're here, and their uh, president or vice president, senior vice president, is Rich Kohler. I think y'all hesitant about clapping now that uh, I'm not sure they're here. 
Uh, and Pad Construction, the firm that actually built the construction of the pad itself, Fraser Engineering, with Michelle Schultz as president and John Fraser, the vice president. And, uh, and, uh, and finally, the, uh, the UPSS Fabricator. If you get a chance to look at these up close, it's really a work of art. Um, fabricating something like this that looks good and is functional is a tough thing to do, but uh, precision fabricating and cleaning is here, and Jason Shy, their CFO, is representing them. So in closing, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the team that's developed this, and not only just this pad 39C, but actually the last several years of pulling together what has really been a remarkable transformation. Like I say, we're not done, but we, we really feel like we've, we've accomplished a lot and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Okay, Scott, don't go too far. Um, Bob and Scott, if you could please come back and join join us here in the front. And I also at this time would like to invite some of the key partners into the, uh, the design and construction of uh, Launchpad 39C to join Mr. Cabana and Mr. Colorado for the official ribbon cutting. So if you gentlemen could please come up front. And Pat Simpkins, Kennedy Engineering and Technology Director. Pat. Uh, Michelle Schultz, who Scott just introduced, President of Fraser Engineering, and Rich Kohler, Senior Vice President for the design firm Jones Edmonds. Thank you all for coming. We have uh, about 15 minutes to take some questions from uh, members of the media if you're interested. Um, and then after that, we'll board a bus and you can go up to Launchpad 39B for a photo op shooting down here looking at Pad 39C. Um, let's see, let me see if we can get uh, Scott or could you please come and join us up here? We just have, like I said, about 15 minutes for some questions. And uh, if you can answer them from up here, that way everybody can get your answer. Great. Sure. Uh, I'll go with James. I think I saw James' hand up first. Okay, sure. Uh, Scott, what was the cost of this project? And can you give us a sense of, when you talk about a small class vehicle, what does that mean? What's the sort of the range of size of uh, your vehicle or payload that you see? So the question is about what the cost of the pad was um, and uh, also the size of the vehicles, the types of vehicles. So uh, the cost was right around $900,000 to build this, which is, I would have to say, one of the most affordable uh, launch pad development costs ever. Of course, the beauty of this, you're taking advantage of the site that's already available, the utilities, the commodities and all, so that helps us a lot. Uh, so that's, that's the cost of the pad itself. As far as the, the, the class of vehicles, you're talking in the thousand pounds or so, plus or minus. It really depends. I mean, there's a wide range. The fact that it's so variable and the companies bring their own ground support equipment, then you can, it's, it's very versatile. You, you're not going to see an Atlas or a Falcon or anything like that off of here, obviously. You're talking rockets that are in the order of 80 to 100 feet tall kind of thing, and uh, you know, a lot leaner than what we're used to seeing now. So, I'm sorry, I couldn't follow, but I mean, is there given that you are right next to Pad B, um, I'm sure there was some careful study of, you know, if you have a mishap or something, is there any potential impact there? Obviously, it's, it's, they're small enough that that's not going to be an issue. Right. That's that's the, the question is about overlapping uh, hazards between the sites 39B and 39C. So that's, that's exactly what we've, we've laid out. Um, ideally, maybe they'd be a little farther apart, but we, we've evaluated the risk, and depending on the rocket and the commodities, each one would be evaluated one at a time. We, we think we're in good shape to handle a wide variety, not necessarily all of them, but a wide variety to where one rocket was, wouldn't affect the other. Now, the, the debris zones, so to speak, from the SLS uh, are bigger, but uh, we feel that the, the short pad time that you're rolling out here 
getting off the pad is so quick that we think that risk is minimal. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, like Chris Haver, Paper Digital Media. Uh, I was wondering, um, is this going to be strictly assigned as a commercial space, or will there be um, suborbital NASA flights from here? Um, in the, uh, did, are there plans to possibly acquire um, old missiles from GAO to fire them off as of sounding rockets, like Wallops does? Uh, you know, will, will, will you be doing? Um, some of the pre-testing that's done on the suborbital flights for NASA rather than for commercial before it gets to the main mission level. Right, so the, the question is really about what types of rockets and how much of a variety do we handle and really the answer is potentially all of the above. Um, again, we don't dictate this. We'll be a NASA site, a NASA pad, NASA operated, uh, but generally we think in host mode where the, the vehicles that want to use it would be able to operate their rocket for the most part go through launch and countdown and so forth and actually launch it. Um, but we really we really are not limiting it, other than the fact that there is a limit of thrust that above a certain level is not designed for that. But could you specify on that? Uh, I think we're talking, uh, I'd have to get back to you. I think I know the number, but I'm not confident enough to say it right now. I can get back to you, but it's basically, I'll go through Mike and let you know. But it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a, what we call a small class vehicle, but the limits of that really okay. depend on the commodity, the size, and that sort of thing. Okay. So the liquid, for example, versus a solid would be different. So, yeah. well, I think you I, got a question. Uh, Jerry in News 13, now, when do, you, when do you expect this to be ready to go then, and ready for launches? We think uh, we would be launch ready uh, no earlier, uh, I'll say uh, early 2017, late 2016 with a full up uh, complement. Um, but I will say, though, that if the more the actual user brings, and again, it's so flexible, they could bring a lot, and it's, it's virtually ready now for a user to come along and bring their whole system. Um, the UPSS system still has to go through uh, some checkouts and some testing yeah. off-site. It'll be about a year or so before that's ready, but uh, it, it depends on the user and depends on how soon the agreements come together, and frankly, it depends on the contracts they might win you know, from, from their customers. So you've, been, you've been talking to some companies, and I know it's the size of the vehicle that matters, but in the companies you've been talking to, what kind of missions do you envision to be launched out here? So the question is about what kind of missions uh, do we envision. Uh, the big backlog right now is university research, CubeSat, small uh, venture class type uh, payloads. Uh, there's a backlog developing, and they're, they're really dying to get these off the ground. That's probably the main thing. The other big thing nowadays is you know, companies are going to these smaller constellations of small satellites. So instead of, you know, maybe one big satellite and launched every few years, highly valuable, hard to replace, going to a lot of smaller uh, constellations where they can put up a, a, a high number of them. If you lose one, it's not as big of a deal. The beauty of this is that they wouldn't have to fly as a secondary payload. So they're not stuck is in an orbit that, that they'd rather not be in or a launch manifest that they'd rather not do. With this, they can basically dictate the time and the uh, inclination of that launch, which is, is important to the commercial customer. Okay, anybody else? Any questions? All right. All right, thank you. All right, thank you all once again very much for coming today. Uh, it's a very historic day, the opening of Launchpad 39C, and as I mentioned, uh, now uh, if you could please make your way to the buses, and you'll be uh, taken up to Launchpad 39B for a photo opportunity to look and shoot down here at Launchpad 39C. Thank you again.